Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. What I was telling you, Professor, was that you know, I'm going to talk about income inequality. And what I'd like to do is really have a discussion with you about this. Well, what I thought I'd do is just lay out kind of the framework of what's happening in the states now, you know, surrounding that issue, a little bit about you know, kind of how we got there, what it looks like, what the dimensions of the, um, the income inequality problem is, and what the political fallout's been, which I think has been surprising because it's been less than you might, might expect. You know, so what do we mean when we talk about, you know, growing inequality? What, what, what does that really speak to? And obviously, you know, we're talking about the widening gap between those at the top and those at the bottom. You know, people are making vastly different sums of money in, in the United States now, and, and the disparity it hasn't been greater since the Great Depression. So we're kind of in a new place in this, uh, in our country, you know? And what's made the situation alarming isn't just that there's this gap, but the gap has kind of happened because things are happening on one end. People at the top are making a lot more while everyone else, and when I say the top, it's really the top 1%, but you could even say the top 10% is doing better, but everyone else is kind of flatlined in our economy, and that's a real problem, and, and trying to figure out how to untangle that I think is going to be a problem that President Obama faces if he has another term or if uh, good old Mitt Romney wins, he'll also have to contend with that. So that's, so that's what we're looking at. You know, by one calculation, when adjusted for inflation, the hourly wage of the average American has gone up just 10% when adjusted for inflation between 1979 and 2009. I mean, think about that, 10%. At the same time, the income of the top 1% has gone up 275%. That's just one dimension of this problem. And just indulge me for a few more facts here. The share of the national income going to the top 1% has doubled since 1979. The top 1% of Americans pocket more than 20% of the national income. The top 1% of Americans own one-third of the nation's wealth. By contrast, the bottom half own 2.5% of America's wealth. Amazing kind of disparity there. The top 1% own more than one half of the nation's investment assets. And that's a big deal in America because investment income is taxed at a much lower rate than earned income, the kind of um, the wages someone earns on a job. The bottom half owns, the bottom half now of Americans own 0.5% of those assets. So again, that's, a, that's another great market there. What the bottom, where the bottom kind of comes out with a bigger number is in debt. They owe more. The bottom 90% has three quarters of the nation's debt. They, they're juggling school loans, home mortgages that are, in birth, uh, that are worth more than their homes are worth in many cases now, um, consumer debt, auto loans, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of what, what we're looking at when it comes to that. And all of this was happening even before the crash. I mean, that's the funny thing. America's economy is kind of on kind of this weird trajectory even before the financial crash that saw so many people lose so much you know, in 2007, 2008, and 2009, really, before things began to heal, and they're, they're barely healing. Now, people argue that maybe some of these stats are not as bad as they may appear. I, I've talked to economists who say, you know, the shape of households has changed in the last 30 years. There are more single-person households, so maybe some of these wealth disparities aren't as severe as they sound. And even, but even allowing for that, I think, I think we could all agree that income inequality is becoming, wealth inequality has become a major, major issue. And sort of making that even worse is that the things that Americans use to climb the ladder, the, the idea, the great American ideal of, of kind of the American dream of making it from the bottom to the top, it seems like the levers for that, the, the, the rungs for that, that ladder has become more difficult to navigate. It's harder to become middle class in America, in short. And if you're middle class, it's harder to stay that way. You're as likely to slip down as you are to climb up. A report last year found that nearly one third of Americans who were born middle class had slipped down the income ladder by the time they reached adulthood. There's been this panel study that's been going on for over 30 years at um, the University of Michigan, and they found that. And it's quite an amazing thing, and that's so, so unlike the American ideal in many ways. And like I said, it's harder for Americans to make the leap from the lower classes to the middle or to the upper middle classes. It's like the income inequality is being, inequality is being locked in. And you can see that when you even just look at how Americans live, the patterns of our lives. 
you go to neighborhoods now, and people live around people like them. They go to school with people like them. I think back on my own childhood. I grew up in New York City. My parents were immigrants. They didn't have very much. One story I always remember is something my mother, my mother's 91 years old now, she still talks about this. When I was a, just a toddler running around the apartment, we lived in Harlem, just north of Central Park in Manhattan. And my mother worked as a housekeeper. My dad worked in a parking garage. But she talks about looking out the window off and looking out on 110th Street and seeing a big black car pull up for one of our neighbors. The guy happened to be a member of the city council. A guy named Ewan Jack is one of the first African-American members of the New York City Council, I believe. And that had an effect. That made a difference. I mean, it was like, it made, I think, a difference in our family's kind of aspirations, one. And there were practical effects. I mean, there were things like, you know, our street got swept, and, you know, and, and the schools were attended to a little bit because we had power living right there, and, and wealth to some degree. And he's living shoulder to shoulder with, you know, a woman who was a domestic. My mother later went on to work for the city, and my dad too. But at the time, we were of very modest means. And, but yet, we're living next door to a guy who was a city official. And I would argue that that doesn't happen much anymore in our country. You have these patterns, like I said, where people kind of separate among themselves. And, and the same goes for education. I remember going to school with all kinds of different students. I went to one of New York City's, um, what they call specialized high schools. You have to take a test when you go to the high school, and most of us who got into those schools were able to go on to college. 95% of us went on to college, which is, which is fairly remarkable. And again, now the competition for those schools is unlike anything that existed back in my day. I mean, people are buying to get into preschools. They want to get their leg up very early to, to get their kids into a certain place so they'll progress. They want them in the top class, in the top school, in the, in the best specialized high school. The last time I looked at the um, statistics for New York specialized high school, very few minority students. And they don't break it down by income, but I'll, I'm telling you, it's going to be very few low income students as well. So you can see how this kind of this inequality kind of learns, kind of starts to perpetuate itself. It goes just on and on and on. And nowhere is the competition more, more intense than going to college, as we say, you guys say uni, right? But going to college is, is where I think this becomes most intense. It's, and in many ways, college, obviously education is a great equalizer when it comes to inequality. I mean, you get educated, typically you get a better job, you get more income, and that sort of thing. But what we have now in America is almost like a self-sustaining system. It's not 100% that way, but it's leaning more in that direction. There are maybe 100 or 150 competitive colleges in the United States. There are many thousands of colleges, but there are only there's that elite group of colleges where people really compete to get into. Most schools are essentially open admissions. But the schools you heard of here, you know, the Harvards, the Yales, um, University of California, Berkeley, are very, very hard to get into. And the outcomes for those students are a lot different, typically, not always, than they would be for a city college or, or some of the other schools that are, that are much easier. And again, much easier to get into. And again, there's a difference between who goes where. You go onto the campus of, uh, I was just telling a professor about my son graduated from Washington University in St. Louis. It's, it's a very good school. You go there, the kids are identical. My daughter went to Columbia University for medical school. It's the same kids, and it's the upper middle class that's able to penetrate that kind of this elite circle. And, th and that's what's happening. And that's, and that's a big change. When I went to Boston University, the cost of Boston University was $5,000 a year. And that's back in the 70s. And it seemed like a lot of money. Now to go to that school is $50,000 a year. And out of reach clearly for most people, even with financial aid. The average student graduates from college in America with $23,000 in debt. And that's average. Many have much more, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars in debt to come out with a bachelor's degree and most likely get a job paying no more than 25, 30, 35 thousand dollars to start out. So you see where it is, it's just harder. It feels like it's just harder to get ahead. And it doesn't stop with college, even when it comes to um, retirement. Americans are increasingly concerned about that. They're feeling more insecure. Like any um, investment professional, you go see a financial planner in the States and you talk about retirement, they, they talk about the three-legged stool you should have. Social Security, which is like kind of our old age in the United States. 
You should have your own savings. That should be another leg of the stool. And you should have a private pension from your employer. And together, those three should hold you through, through your retirement. But increasingly, Americans don't have two of those legs. And they're talking about making cuts to Social Security. So again, you know, this inequality is growing. It's, it's kind of, I think, engulfing people. And it's really hard to know, you know, how we're going to change that. The one survey I'll cite here said that just 14% of Americans, one four, 14%, feel confident, confident about their ability to live comfortably in retirement. So that gives you some idea. I was just telling you, Professor, I was out in Las Vegas. Another thing, you know, Americans depend on in retirement is their um, home equity, the, the amount of money they have in their homes. I was there working on a story about, um, about swing states in America and how the economy is affecting voter behavior. And since 2006, the average home in Nevada has lost 67% of its value, two-thirds of its value. So what does that say for home equity? There is none. 70% of homeowners are underwater, meaning they owe more on their mortgages than their homes are worth. So again, these are all things kind of like hitting Americans, I think, sort of making, kind of creating kind of an economic tension and making people talk about this thing that we call inequality. And you can see this is a real issue, but, but what, what's caused this? One argument that economists make, and I find it pretty convincing, is that there's kind of this, uh, been a, the link between productivity and wages has been broken in America. During what many people call the golden era of the American economy, post-World War II into the late 70s, when America was a major manufacturer, we're still a major manufacturer, but a dominant manufacturer in the globe, people made more money as their companies became more productive. And you could kind of, I wish I had a chart, but in lockstep, these things went up together. Productivity went up along with wages, and wages were pulled up by productivity. But in 1979, that link broke. Productivity has com um, continued to go up, but now rather than those profits accruing to workers, they have gone to corporate profits and, and to people who own the assets. Again. So that's been one big change. You know, some people bl blame the surge in globalization, which put workers in competition, not just with workers in their town or across town or across the country, but with workers around the world. And that pulled down what workers could demand, and the workers lost leverage, and they couldn't get the kind of wages they wanted in the past. The same is true when you look at technology. Technology has intruded on workers. Uh, America has recently sort of enjoyed a little bit of a manufacturing renaissance. We're making more stuff that uh, the number of uh, manufacturing jobs has gone up, but this is after a decade of being hollowed out. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of jobs have disappeared in America's factories. And a lot of them have gone to robots and, and, you know, and, and automated manufacturing processes. Another thing that's gone, that's almost essentially left the, the, the private employment scene in America is trade unions. Unionization is way down in America. The, the only group of employees who are, the majority of whom are part of unions now are public employees, which has created an interesting backlash in my country. And, you know, so the people who work for the city or the federal government or the state, they're part of a union, and many other people aren't. And that's created kind of a resentment where people are resentful of, of, of the public employees because of their benefits, because of the kind of protections that the unions afford them. So these are all things, I think, that have contributed to, to what we see with, um, with inequality. But probably the biggest factor separating those at the top and other workers is how people earn their money, as I said, and how those earnings are taxed. Taxes on investment income are capped at 15% in America, one five, 15%. And Meaning that anyone making more than $35,000 in wages in America, $35,000 a year, is paying more, a higher tax rate than someone who owns capital gains, who has this, what we call capital gains income. Now, most Americans have at least a few investments, often through their 401ks, which is kind of a retirement savings account, but those are tax deferred anyway, so the average American doesn't get the advantage of kind of these tax benefits. And the argument goes that, of course, the capital gains and, and investment income create 
future growth and they shouldn't be taxed more heavily. And, and that's one today really with both Democrats and Republicans in, uh, in America. Over the past 20 years, more than 8% of the capital gains income realized in the United States has gone to 5% of the people. Over half has gone to the wealthiest 1% alone. Just another example of what we have. Another factor has been, I think, in this inequality is a growth in executive compensation. Recent studies have found that the largest single chunk of the highest income earners are not entertainers or rock stars or basketball players, but corporate executives, and they've seen their pay skyrocket. Last year, our paper did a story about this, and it focused on a dairy company that back in the 70s paid its chief executive the equivalent of $1 million a year. So we went back and looked at the same company. Now the top executive in that company earns more than $10 million a year. Not only does he make $10 million a year, but he has he has an office in a fancy tower now that didn't exist before, and he has access to a corporate jet. And that's kind of, in a way, a metaphor for what's happened. Now, again, the argument is, okay, this dairy's growing a little more complex. They operate in more markets. Running a place like that is not what it was 30 years ago. It's a, it's a tougher job, arguably. But I don't know that it's gotten 10 times harder, you know, to sort of warrant that kind of compensation. But that's the picture what, that we have in this country. Remember, you know, everyone else is flatlining, and these guys are you know, see multiples of increases in their salary. Overall, executive compensation is just about quadrupled since the 1970s, as pay for everyone else is stalled. So, you know, you have this picture, you would think, okay, what's the country going to do about that? It's, you know, you would think there'd be a political movement to sort of deal with that. And they have been, but they've kind of moved in kind of interesting directions, in my view. One reaction to all of this, I think, has been the Tea Party movement. You guys have probably heard about that. And the Tea Party, but the thing that's animated the Tea Party is government spending, which, however inaccurately aimed, I think government spending is aimed at trying to close that gap for the most part. But the Tea Party, their, their call to arms is to reduce the reach of government to, you know, because and they kind of speak to the American distrust of government. They're not talking so much about corporations. Yes, they're, you know, they, they're concerned about inequality. They talk about that. But the thing that rallies them is the idea that government is too intrusive, too expensive. And that's been one thing. Um, and of course, you guys know about the Occupy movement. You've heard a lot about that. It's gotten a lot of coverage in our country, in the newspapers, probably around the world. It's become kind of a global phenomenon. But I'll argue that. Occupy, while it's, I think, articulated this problem, you know, obviously they talk about, you know, we're, one of the, we're part of the 99%, that's kind of their rallying cry. I don't think that's really shown itself yet to be a true political movement in America. Maybe that will come in the future, but the politicians, even Obama, the most liberal Democrats, are very gingered when it comes to this issue. They don't want to embrace that too closely. I think it speaks a little bit, I guess, to the American ideal. They don't want to be... They don't want to sort of like frown on success too much because I think, if nothing else, America is a very aspirational place. So even if you're not part of the 1%, you think, and, and the rungs of the ladder are getting farther apart, you think that somehow you're going to climb that ladder, you'll be the one up there one day, so you don't want to tear that person down. So that's interesting, interesting to me because I don't think this is translated politically the way many people think it would. And a recent poll, and I'll end here, sort of, um, underscores that, you know, it's the percentage of Americans, even before all this happened, the percentage of Americans who say the country is divided into haves and have-nots has declined, not increased, over the past 10 years. People actually, you know, think that things are, not that they think things are fine, but they don't think the country is divided that way. And more than 6 in 10 Americans see themselves as the haves. That's how they define themselves, even though the facts would say something else. So that's something interesting. To think about. You know, in, in um, writing about that poll, one columnist said that they called this the new American delusion. And I don't know if I'd be that harsh, but I think it does speak to a little bit to the American character, like I said, the aspirational sort of nature of, this, uh, of, of America and the idea that Americans always see or imagine a brighter tomorrow coming. And I, but I don't know if that's realistic or not right now, given what, you know, what, what we see happening. Anyway, that's just the basic outline. I'm curious to hear kind of your thoughts and, and, and kind of what you guys are hearing about, you know, inequality in America, what you think about that, and uh, just look forward to talking with you, taking your questions. Questions? Um, I'll give you 
you one example. When I was in Vegas, I visited a block where President Obama had visited back in October to announce a new housing program kind of aimed at forestalling this, this steep declining housing prices. And I went to that street. It was a small subdivision, two-story homes, three- and four-bedroom homes with garages, built in 2004. And when the homes were built, they sold for $210,000 during the height of the real estate boom, and we had, and Nevada had a real estate boom almost like nowhere else in America. Those homes were selling, by mid-2006, those homes were selling for $330,000, $340,000. Now, the same homes are going for seventy-five dollars and $85,000. Unemployment in Nevada is 12%. It's been in double figures since 2009. The state leads the country not only in unemployment, but in bankruptcies, and in, in the amount of home equity that people have lost, the decline in wealth. So, I mean, and that's the kind of thing you see, not just in Nevada, in, you know, in Vegas, but you see that in many parts of what we call the American Sun Belt, you know, fast growing areas of the, country, of the country where you had a lot of immigration. We had people moving from what we call the Rust Belt or the Northeast to come enjoy the good weather and the apparent boom that's turned to bust now. So that's just, you know, kind of what's happening. And that's a very typical story in Vegas, like I said. Really, it's really sad to see. And, and talking to people about it is interesting, I think, because people don't quite know who to blame. They don't even know what happened. It's kind of like the world wouldn't hit them. And now they're just trying to pick up the pieces. They don't know. You, you say, who do you blame? Do you blame the banks? Do you blame Obama? And people are kind of like, you know, all over the place when it comes to answering that question. No one really has a firm idea. Yes? You know, I would think that this will reach its limits one day, but so much has changed. You, you think about just even how a corporation operates now. It's so different, I think, than how a corporation operated 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, I think this idea of being a, a, I don't know, of national purpose, if you will, doesn't exist now for corporations because they operate globally. And, and you know, corporations, I think, used to think about, well, quality of life in in their home country, maybe they paid a little extra rent on their wages to people just to keep things going. But now I think the number one thing is return to investors. That's become, that's eclipsed so much. So I'm going to bring efficiencies from everywhere. And, and you can't blame these guys because if they don't do this, they're going to be ousted, you know, and, and, and they're going to bring someone else in to, to be more, you know, more cutthroat, if you will. But I, but I think you make a great point. I mean, people are always what Henry Ford, the, the, the auto magnet, and he said, you know, people who work in my factory should be able to afford the cars that they make. I mean, it's a simple kind of premise because it feels like that's the only way, only thing that would be sustainable. So I think it remains to be seen, but I, I don't know if we've reached that point yet because as I was saying, I don't even think that the American people have come to terms with this, you know, to kind of force, you know, the elites to sort of um, see things a different way. In Vegas, I, I, mean, I posed a very question, that very question to an economist who said it could be 20 years in Vegas before things are back to normal, if you define normal as being getting back to peak housing prices. The problem that we have is, like, you know, President Obama talks about this all the time, is trying to have kind of a real foundation for the economy. Another thing they said about Vegas was they had reached the housing market had reached the point where they were building housing for construction workers. So growth was kind of fueling growth, and it was not a thing to s sustain that level of kind of economic activity. 
So I think it's, we're kind of in for a long-term project. And American people, I don't know if they're, they're really understanding of that yet. You know, the kinds of things that are, that are going to make a difference are investments in education, investments in uh, innovation, and things like that. And these are slow processes. And the American people have a lot of impatience with that kind of thing. The tea, that's why the Tea Party movement was, I think, was so um, potent. Um, Obama has done things like invest in alternative energy, trying to find kind of that industry of the future. And there have been some spectacular failures in those government investments, and that's something that's gotten, I think, more attention from people and kind of sparked more outrage than has um, the idea of inequality. So I think it's going to take these long investments to get back, but nothing quick. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier the fact that in capital gains income and all that's taxed a lot lower. I think one of the sort of poster boys from the rich on that side has been Warren Buffett. He sort of has come out a few times and said, you know, it's ridiculous that my secretary, you know, personal secretary pays more tax than he does. Right. But what I thought was interesting was the proposals that he was pushing for to the changes to investment tax actually wouldn't affect him at all. I think it was a bit of criticism of the fact that he was coming out saying this is terrible. When you looked beyond that, you saw so that he wouldn't end up having to pay any more tax anyway. So I was just wondering, do you think that tax and investment income at a, at a higher rate is, is the solution? Or do we need, a, do we need a, a, a sort of middle ground balance, perhaps, of maybe lowering income taxes and also addressing some of the, the causes and the fact that those at the lower end of the spectrum are perhaps sometimes, uh, especially with the younger generations these days, that are trying to a bit live a little bit more beyond their means and, and borrow a bit more in the sense that they want things now, you know, they might be getting high expensive car loans that push them into the debt as opposed to say getting a second hand car, for example, yeah. that could be causing some of these debt loans. I think there's no like one solution. I think it's gonna take kind of contributions from everyone. And in, and in this area I think Obama's been complicit. You know, he's made a big deal about talking about you know, capital gain tax increases. And I think they could raise the capital gains rate, from what I can tell. It's 15% if they raised it to 20%. I don't know if it needs to parallel kind of, you know, wage taxes, but I think that can go up. But I think it's going to actually take middle class people paying a little more in taxes. When Obama ran for office in 2008, he, uh, he said he's not going to raise taxes on anyone. He had a tax cut for everyone, every family earning under a quarter million dollars a year. And median household income in the United States is roughly $50,000 a year. So he's kind of captive of the same kind of politics, I think, at some level. I mean, now he talks about a tax on millionaires. You know, if, if that happened, it wouldn't attack the debt problem. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to give us the kind of, um, the government, the kind of capital to make the investments I think are needed to, to help start to level this playing field. You know, so I think it's going to take sort of a more honest political debate, but I don't think any politician is willing to have that because I think they, you know, quite frankly, I think they think they'll lose if they talk about taxing kind of a broad spectrum of people. Say taxing everyone, you know, every household making more than $100,000 a year, just a little bit more. Um, you know, reducing <coughs> uh, cost of living increases for Social Security recipients, perhaps if they have the other legs of the stool, you know, and just a little bit. All these things would make a huge difference, but no one's putting those forward. And, and again, I think a lot of it has to do with kind of an American idea. You know, we also have this notion of, I don't know, where, maybe it looks really the same way, I don't know, this rugged individualism, I'm going to make it on my own. And the sense of the collective is not a very powerful one in our country. But, like, you would have thought that the GSC would have been a massive wake-up call for the way you know, the finance system is run, and the inequality in the US. You would think, you know, but, but it's just baffling. It's baffling because I, I guess part of it also is people only understand but so much. I mean, I mentioned the backlash against public employees. Like, you know, tomorrow is the recall election for the governor of Wisconsin, who was kind of the leader in that effort in, um, in curtailing collective bargaining rights for public employees. And I went to Wisconsin a couple of times to do stories about that. And it's amazing how animated people got. When you talk to them, you ask them their stories, and they would say, you know what, I've been downsized out of two or three jobs. I don't have a pension. 
I'm 62 years old. And, but they have a neighbor who maybe works for the state or is a retired teacher or you know, some other public, type of public employee. And they can kind of comprehend what they have. And then the, they know that guy may be retiring at age 59 with 70% pay. They won't talk about the guy didn't earn that much money you know, all those many years and stayed on that job for 30 or 35 years. But it's something that has a, kind of have, they have a visceral reaction to in a way that when you talk about banks, when you talk about bank regulation, and you talk about capital gains taxes, people don't even know what you're yeah, talking about. Also, this morning I read that um, in Wisconsin they haven't had a Republican, I mean, they haven't had a Democratic governor since 86. And so that is something that they have to deal with. Yeah, I can't remember if that's the case. But you know what? They voted for Obama by a big margin yeah. in 08. You know, it's a classic swing state in presidential elections. It's going Democratic the last several elections. So it's, it's not a very conservative place, and you know, overall, it's actually the birthplace in many ways of the, of, of, uh, the union movement out there. So it's interesting, that was really, really poignant. Yes? Uh, do you think that issues like this will have an effect on Romney's campaign since he can't be all that humble about as well as the kind of political narrative related to him? Or do you think that he'll be kind of close to what he can achieve? Uh, what you can, I think. Well, he's hoping the latter, you know, I think, I think the jury's out, <laughs> you know, we don't know how that's going to play. But I do know this, Obama has gone after him a bit about his work at Bain Capital, you know, in private equity, and that hasn't gone over so well. Even Democrats have kind of called him on that, you know, Bill Clinton, uh, Cory Booker, the mayor of Newark. You know, so they don't go too far with these attacks. I mean, private equity is a, you know, is, is a cornerstone of the capitalist system. You know, so it depends. I think Romney is hoping that, and I think that again, it's this American myth of the businessman, a guy who understands all of this complexity that goes on, and, you know, in the economy. And, and I think he's counting on people looking at him as someone who understands what they don't understand. So, so we'll see. But you know, two, three months ago, I would have said that Obama's a lock on the election. But now that things are stalling economically in my country, I think that um, Romney has a real chance, and a lot of it will be because of his standing as a businessman in the mind of the voting public. How do you think um, the Tea Party will go in the Congress election? Because even though they've won big in 2010, yeah. um, do you think like, the American people would have seen sort of like a bias beware in terms of the way they operate, no compromise type of thing? Right. Um, yeah, it's much not even trying, not even attempting to negotiate. Um, yeah, I think that they've peaked. My sense is that they won't be the same influence they were in 2010, but in many ways, I think the damage is done in some ways, you know? I mean, the whole tenor, I mean, it's hard to even describe, the whole tenor of the conversation has changed in America. I mean, you have Obama himself, I think largely because of the Tea Party, saying things like, you know, the American government has to learn how to live within its means, you know? And even in this time of kind of uh, economic distress, where I think most economists would argue that Indeed, you have to get a handle on the long-term debt picture. But interest rates are low, government borrowing is not, you know, at least hasn't reached that tipping point yet. I think most people would argue if you were able to make policy outside of the realm of politics, there would be kind of more stimulus type stuff, more infrastructure investment now, but some kind of long-term plan to reduce the long-term debt, like in retirement costs and healthcare costs. But I think the Tea Party's changed that conversation. I think for, for a long time. Um, question, what do you think of the way um, the Occupy Wall Street protests frame the issue of income inequality in the United States? And do you think it was a setback in raising awareness? Oh, I think that, no question, I think it put this issue on the map kind of in a way that the average American could understand. Because, again, a lot of these issues you know, we talk about actually existed long before the crisis. And this has been kind of, we've been on this glide path since the 70s. But no one quite faced up to it. And I think Occupy did put it on the map. But it was also, I think, an element to Occupy. I think where some people saw them as kind of the people who kind of animated that movement as kind of professional protesters, if you will. The same people who come out when the G8's in town or something like that. I think that may have hurt them in terms of uh, the ability of kind of mainstream political leaders to embrace them. You know, Obama, his, you know, he's a cautious politician anyway. He's, you know, he said a few kind things about him, but he's not going to say too much. I mean, Obama hasn't gone to Wisconsin to um, campaign against Scott Walker, the guy who 
strip collective bargaining rights because he's always playing it safe. That's just his political style. So I think Occupy put the movement on the table, but I think the people, or maybe they want to say the people saying the specifics, just the kind of the theater around it has made many politicians a little wary of embracing them too closely. Um, you've been writing uh, a series of articles on the swing states. Yeah. Um, so what are the, what's the pattern emerging from these swing states? Do you, do you see some similarities of the issues that continue to be raised, or is Nevada completely different from the issues raised in this concept? Um, I mean, they each have their own character, but I think overall this sense of economic anxiety and kind of economic, not quite distress, but uncertainty is, is the thing that pervades. Like you go to a state like Wisconsin, Ohio is a state that I visited frequently. And it's a place that's actually, by the numbers, improving economically. Unemployment's down. They haven't had, they didn't have the big housing run up, nor the big housing bust that a place like Nevada had. But it's also a place that's kind of a manufacturing heartland of America, and it was pounded for years. Even when every, the rest of the country was doing well, Ohio was losing jobs through most of the past 12, 13 years. So even now that things are getting better in a place like that, people don't even quite believe it. They, they've been so pumped, you know, for years and years and years. They've seen their kids, you know, these are people who are used to being able to go to a GM plant, walk in the front door and get a job that pays a living wage. And, you know, they follow, they follow their fathers into that job, but their sons couldn't follow them because things have changed. So you get that sense of anxiety wherever you go. In Florida is another one of those states, more like Nevada, where you kind of had this kind of growth fueling, growth kind of economic cycle which, without a real foundation. At least Ohio, you have kind of this manufacturing heritage, if you will, and the manufacturing infrastructure. So I think the thing that links them is this kind of um, economic anxiety. And also they're linked by the, this kind of confusion about kind of what's happening and who's to blame. That's something else that you see a lot in our country. People don't, again, they don't point the finger in one direction. Yes. Okay. Um, you outlined um, some of the constraints on politicians, um, and you gave us really good insight into um, the problems that are being faced at the moment. Um, what would you do about it? What can you do about it? It's, it would take an, I think it would take an enormously talented politician to be honest with the American people about kind of what it takes and the kind of sacrifice that it's going to take to sort of put things back on track. I think Obama was kind of in that position, but didn't go far enough. I think he made a mistake with his uh, tax pledge. I mean, he would say, I mean, maybe not him, but one of the Axel Rod would say, you kidding? He wouldn't be elected if he didn't make that tax pledge, and we wouldn't be talking about it. But I think it's going to take someone who's going to rally Americans kind of to a common cause. And it's not just like the 1% that's the problem. It's like all of us have to sort of be in this fight. You know, people aren't all wrong when they say many Americans who signed those liar loans and the no-doc loans that took mortgages, you know, on $400,000 homes when they were making $50,000 a year. They, I mean, you have to argue they should have known better. You know, so you need to have that kind of honest discussion. And I think, um, you know, education's a big part of it, and taxes are a part of it. We have to pay a little bit more to make the kind of public investments that I think yield a dividend, not tomorrow, next, not next week, but a decade from now, 15, 20 years from now. But that's hard. I think people are very present time oriented. And, uh, you know, they're impatient, they want their stuff, and uh, <laughs> they don't want to give anything up. And so, I don't, know if it, I don't know if it's within reach right now. I don't know if it's going to take things getting much worse before there's a sense of, uh, you know, we're in it together. Yes, sir.
feels like a tri it, like it's a tri it feels like a trickier thing because I think we um, we misremember our history. You know, so much of um, what happened during the American decades, I think, was based on government investment. After World War II, the GI Bill sent thousands and thousands of troops to college for the first time. There was huge investment in our infrastructure, but people don't think of it that way. <laughs> they think of it like Whatever. My, my grandfather was part of the greatest generation, and he, you know, he was a valiant guy, and he made sacrifices, and he did it. You know, that plays into the America that people remember. You know, Obama's tried to invoke that here and there, and again, he has, he's been tepid about it. So maybe, maybe if he had been sort of more dogged, it, it could have happened. But I think he's constrained. He's constrained a little bit by race, despite the fact that he was elected. It's still this kind of, there's always this kind of critique of him, like, is he... Is he a radical, you know? And he's and he tries to say everything kind of like you say, the kind of steep it in American mystique. But so much of the American mystique is about individualism that I think it's harder for the left. achievement of his, and that, that almost goes to speak to me what, what American politics have become. It's, I think it's a crowning achievement that he's, he almost never talks about the public anymore because it's been so vilified by its opponents. And no one's really stood up. Obama has offered different rationales for it through the years, and, but they never really had a strong kind of case that touched people in a visceral way. So I don't, I'll be curious to see myself. It's hard to know what he's going to do, and I think it depends on what the ruling says. You know, I mean, because there's so many ways they can tailor that. But I, I think clearly Obama will, you know, run, a, you know, run against a decision striking it down. But I wonder how front and center he'll put that, because I think they read the polls. It's interesting. People 
don't like Obamacare. It's, it's, but it's a conundrum. People don't like it, but if you ask them questions and polls and sort of take basic, just single elements out of Obamacare, it's like, do you like the idea that um, if you have health insurance, you can keep your children on your health insurance to age 26? It's part of Obamacare. People say, I like that. You know, and you know, do you like the idea that the insurance company has to insure you even if you have a pre-existing medical condition? People say, I like that. So do you like Obamacare? No, I don't, I don't like that. And, you know, so you're kind of dealing with a kind of a little insanity there. Well, it's just my, I don't understand why people are against it because if you look at what the Supreme Court's trying to do on, they seem to have a problem, or people seem to have a problem with the idea of government telling you to do something, right? Right, but exactly. Constitutionally, what's the difference, what's the difference between, say, government taking money from you and then giving it to someone else? Mm -hmm. Like, say, the defense spending, but then just telling you, well, save us the time, just buy it yourself. Yeah, I don't know what the legal, I don't know that there's a legal nuance. I think, I think a lot of it just has to do with, again, with American mythology, you know, the idea like you invoke defense spending. People say that's the central mission of our federal government to, you know, provide national security. You know, because I would argue, you know, in, in the United States, states require you to, um, to have car insurance if you can operate an automobile. You know, what's so different? They'll say, well, the federal government's not making you do that. The states are making you do that. That's what they say the, the legal distinction is. You know, so, so I, you know, I, I can't really, I don't understand kind of the rationale for that. I think it gets, again, to American, the American's idea of, hey, I'm doing this on my own, the sense of American liberty, I do what I want to do. But, you know, you can't, I think, I think there's an argument to be made just on the merits, never mind the law, like saying, hold on, if someone's not insured and they break their leg and come to the hospital, guess what? We're all paying for that anyway, whether we know it or not. But somehow, I don't think many people grasp that. 